Hey guys, and welcome to Functional Print Friday. Let's do something a little bit different today. All right, so I got into 3D printing about five years ago, and in those five years, I've picked up some good tricks um, along the way. Some I figured out on my own, some from other people, on uh, how to post-process and repair prints and some good tools to use. So that's what we're gonna do today. We're gonna focus on the tools of the trade, the things that you need uh, to make your parts once they come out of the printer um, have the right fit and finish. Not gonna focus so much on the really the finish part. This isn't about making the parts pretty. Although, I mean, you know, form is important, right? And that form should be well executed. And if you maybe have a couple minor issues with surface finish or something like that in the print that are otherwise gonna stand out and take away from the function, it is nice to clean those up. So, all right, let's make some room on the bench. I don't know who made this mess. All right, perfect, let's make a new mess. All right, so you guessed it, this is my box of shame. This is my box of uh, failed prints or designs that just uh, weren't quite up to the task on a V1. Um, and yeah, there's, there's more. This is just what I grabbed out of the drawer. Um, we're gonna use these uh, so that I can cause some damage on these parts and or try and clean up some of the issues on these parts. Uh, and we'll start with, let's see, we'll start with probably the one tool that everyone's got pair of side cutters. So the primary thing you're probably gonna use these for is just trimming your, your filament when you're swapping filament. And they do work well for that. They also work really well for cleaning up, uh, you know, stringiness on prints uh, or, uh, you know, maybe supports where part of the support still stuck to the print. I don't think I actually have anything here in the pile that would be good to demo these on, but I think it's probably fairly safe to say that everyone watching this video uh, has a set of side cutters and knows how to use them. So we'll set that aside. Up next, um, standard razor knife. This is a Stanley 299. I don't know if they still make this. This was probably my grandfather's actually. Um, I use this quite a bit for uh, cleaning up prints. Uh, if I want to clean something up uh, flush or if I'm trying to trim on an edge. So see, I have a layer line on this print here. I don't know if that actually shifted or if it's, yeah, I think that layer line is because we went from this face down here uh, to a higher vertical section on its own there. So we could come across this and probably kind of clean up that layer line a bit with, uh, with this. And I'll often use this to clean up uh, stringiness and prints as well. Uh, you've got to be really careful because obviously this thing's pretty sharp. So if you slip, you're going to cut yourself bad. So be careful with this one. Um, another one that I use all the time, and I've actually got two of them, uh, is these Noga deburring tools. You notice I've got one marked uh, for plastics. So you can use these on just about anything. Well, I don't know how well they'd work on wood, uh, but they work very well on plastics and most metals. Uh, but when you, if you're using it on metal, you are gonna dull the blade faster. Uh, so I, I have one marked plastics, and this one's usually the one that's down by my 3D printer anyway. Uh, the blade just stays sharper if you only use it for plastics, but these will work for both plastic and metal. A lot of you probably have one of these already. I don't know if you have one of the Noga ones. Um, no affiliation with this company, but this is one of those tools where I do think it's worth it to buy the name brand. Uh, Noga makes really, really good deburring tools. And if, you, if you're not familiar with how you use one of these, again, you wanna make sure your fingers are in a safe position. And typically you'd use this for, uh, well, deburring, but in this case, you might not necessarily have a burr. You might wanna just kinda of clean up the edge of a print maybe where it was flat against the bed, um, and you can just slide this right on the end. I took a pretty big slice there. Normally I wouldn't take off that much, uh, but you might have a little bit of sort of elephant's foot, uh, maybe where it uh, was against the bed, or if you printed with a skirt, and this is what I use this for more often than not, is if I have a print that I used a skirt on for adhesion, I'll break the skirt away, but oftentimes I will have you know the equivalent of a burr there, and it's super easy to just drag this around your part and clean that up. And you can take, uh, I took a really, really light pass on that one. By the way, this is how people cut themselves with these things, is I think trying to clean the, uh, the, uh, the you know, the, the chip, uh, the, the small piece uh, off the blade with their finger, because it's really easy to catch that the wrong way. That thing is razor sharp. Don't let it fool you just because it spins around in there. Uh, but you could take a much deeper cut if you wanted. I mean, you could essentially put a chamfer on the end of your part. Uh, again, 
if you, uh, if you already have one of these in your shop that you use uh, for metalworking or other stuff, consider getting a second one and just marking it plastics. So you'll be a lot happier with using it. If I grab my metalworking one, I actually think I just changed the blade in this one not that long ago. Now you can hear the difference there. This one's already, you can hear it chattering along and that's gonna give me a really rough uh, finish there. Yeah, I can, can feel that with my fingernail. That's because this blade just, you hear that? I'll switch back to this one. Now, now we've messed up the edge, but here I'll switch to this side. That's because this guy's nice and sharp still. So great tool to have. Um, by the way, I'm going to link all these down in the description of this video. They are going to be affiliate links. Uh, what does that mean? It, it's not going to cost you any different. If you click that link and buy it on Amazon, it's going to cost you the same as if you searched for the item and, buy, and bought it on Amazon. The only difference is I get a couple pennies because I sent you there. So if you do buy anything you see in this video, cool, thanks. If not, that's fine too. Um, all right, let's set these guys aside. I'm going to show you another deburring tool that a lot of people I don't think know about uh, or realize is, is around. So these holes might, that's my plastics one, yeah. So these holes aren't too... Yeah, these are getting there where these holes are a bit tight for this deburring tool to get in there. I can, yeah, I can do it. These are, that's, this is about the limit, this size hole. Anything smaller than this, it's really hard to get the tool in there to deburr. Even if it physically fits, even if this end fits in there, you can't get the angle, the, the correct angle on the tool uh, to deburr that hole. But Noga does make a different style of deburring tool. Uh, this just goes in there and then you rotate like this. And that'll clean that up really nice. If you keep pushing, you're going to get a nice chamfer like that. If you just want to kind of take the burr off, or this is the piece that would be flat against the bed. So if this was a hole that had a really tight clearance, it's probably a little bit tighter down here where it was against the bed and that plastic had room to expand. Um, well, not room to expand, but that was probably squished more on that first layer uh, than the rest of your hole. So not only can we put a nice little chamfer on this, but we can open that up just like that. That also gives you a really nice finish. And I don't have two of these. Uh, I have historically just used the same one that I have for metal. It's been okay. Ideally, you'd have one of these for plastics too, and then you know one for steel. But I think just the way that this tool gets used, uh, it's not so bad if it's not sharp. It just it doesn't seem to chatter in the holes. All right, what's next? Um, scraper. This is probably another one that most people have. Uh, this is typically what you would use to separate a print from the bed. Now, I don't have my print bed out here. I do sometimes use this for scraping on the parts as well because it's got a pretty sharp edge on it. Um, like if I have maybe some layer lines due to like a, not really a shift, but a difference in uh, the, the surface finish for if I'm trying to get a nice uh, close fit where um, it's gone from a feature like this to a more vertical feature like this. I do primarily use this to separate parts from the bed though, uh, particularly on my ANET A8 where I still print on uh, masking tape when I run parts on that machine. The reason I have this in the pile is, you notice how old uh, this is. I, I don't remember where I got this, uh, but I went and I grabbed it when I first got into 3D printing uh, because I needed a tool to separate parts from the bed. and. It worked so well, I didn't want to bring it out to the garage. So I ordered another one. Go grab that. All right, that's this guy. And I, I bought a nice one too. I bought, this is Warner. Uh, and it's a thin spring steel blade. This is a tool typically used by uh, painters. Um, and you can see how thin that steel is. It still was not as good as this one. I don't know if it's the, the quality of the steel is just better on this one, or if it's because it's worn so thin from years of use. But I ended up putting the, the new one uh, out in my toolbox in the garage and using the old one uh, at my 3D printing station just because it works so well. So if you see one of these like at an estate sale or something like that and it is that thin spring steel, pick it up. The quality of the steel and the wear on the blade might make it better uh, for use in your 3D printing station than just going out and buying a new one. Okay, other tools. Um, I typically use these for removing support material. Uh, and these are, I, I grabbed two of my pliers here that are both nice pliers. This is another one of those tools, kind of like the, uh, the, the Noga deburring tools, where it just, it really does seem to make a difference to buy a nice tool. They just work so much better, especially for removing supports, because you're often not just gripping and pulling, you're twisting. 
uh, which puts a lot of stress on the hinge on the pliers. And if it's, you know, if they're made with chinesium and they have a loose hinge, uh, they're going to twist and these blades down here are just going to separate and you're not going to get anything done. Um, the two brands I grabbed out of my stash here, this is a Klein Tools uh, pair of pliers. These are made in the USA. I don't know if Klein still makes their pliers in the USA. Um, and then a Knipex. And yeah, I think I am pronouncing that right. I used to always say Nipex, but I think the pronunciation is actually Knipex. Uh, these are made in Germany and these are great. Um, everything, I, everything that I've bought that's made by Knipex, I've been super happy with. Um, but uh, just buy a good brand. Um, Klein's good, Knipex is good. Uh, any of the older USA made ones are also very good, but if you're looking to buy brand new, I would probably either buy Klein or uh, Knipex. And again, these are, I, I don't know that I have, well, okay, let's actually, let's say that this is infill, not support material, but if I was trying to remove this, I might plunge in and then twist. And that twisting action puts a lot of torque uh, on these blades here. And these two, uh, these two quality ones will hold up to that and I can break those supports off without these ends twisting up and they do return back to center. It's just, you know, quality of material that are used in these. And get a couple different styles. I have a straight one here and a curved one makes a big difference for getting into different areas to get supports broken out of place or, or just different motion. Like these, even these ones that are curved, often it just gives me the right angle to come down, grab and twist like this um, rather than being flat with the parts. Makes it easier to hold. All right, this next one is just a standard wood chisel and it is a sharp wood chisel. And I grabbed that in my, my drawer that has my wood chisels in it, but this is always the one that I seem to grab for removing supports. Uh, in fact, let me go grab a print that uh, I did use this on and show you what I mean. All right, here's one of the table covers from my milling machine that I made a couple videos back. Uh, it's just, or part of it anyway, this interlocks with some other pieces. Uh, but if I flip this guy over, you can see I've got a section here. You can see that this is the part that was actually on the printing bed as well as this edge here. Um, and then a recess section uh, that goes against the actual table on the milling machine. This fits into the table, it keys in, and then this goes over the edge of the table, this edge part. Yeah, there's a couple of other ways I could have oriented this and printed it and maybe even designed it that I didn't have all of this, um, uh, this material here to remove, all of these supports, but I wanted this to sit very true and flat on the table, so I just kind of sucked it up and knew I was gonna have a lot of material to remove. Uh, the way I got this off was, I started with the pliers, um, and I broke as much material off as I could and then when I got down towards the end I cleaned it up with a chisel So just I'm not using a hammer nothing like that You're just doing it with your hand make sure your you know your thumb anything's out of the way And you're just going to glide this along and it'll catch any of those raised spots And take them right off and you know, obviously you want a sharp chisel for this uh, A chisel that's not sharp is just going to hang up in the in the part and not go anywhere and if you're not, if you've never used a chisel on wood before, you're not coming in at a really steep angle like this. You're coming in at a really flat angle like that. So you're only biting on the stuff. Almost, you're almost flat against the material. You're just raised up a little bit. You're just biting on the stuff that is raised. So great tool for that. All right. Uh, these two tools I often use for, uh, you know, I don't actually use these that much in finished parts. I'll often use these when I'm prototyping. When I'm on, say, a version one of a print, it's close to fitting, but it doesn't quite fit. And maybe it slips inside of something or something like that. And I want to remove some material from the print so that I can figure out exactly what my fit should be and then get a measurement on it. Um, and then do a revision based on that. I do sometimes, if it's not a part of the, the, the print that you're gonna see once it's installed, I will clean up a part with this or I will relieve a little bit of a part with these two tools um, and actually use that one in production. Again, as long as, long as it's not a surface that you're gonna see. So let's say, uh, I don't know, what's a good example here? Maybe, gosh, I don't know. Let's say that this surface back here um, I think this actually, this is from my RC um, uh, camera uh, mount that goes on top of my Traxxas TRX. Uh, that's also a past video uh, to check out. There's a camera that mounts in here uh, and then a uh, VTX sending unit in here uh, that transmits to a pair of goggles. So you can basically drive it remote. Anyway, this part here slipped under the roll cage, but let's say it was just too tight to slip under the roll cage and I wanted to relieve this a bit. I wanted to remove some material from this. Well, depending on how much material I want to remove, um, 
These are probably the one of, one of these tools is probably the one that I would grab. This is a standard metal file. Uh, it's not going to be super aggressive on the part. It's not going to take off a ton of material in one shot. It's going to take off more than sandpaper, um, but it's not going to take off as much as this guy. This is a wood rasp, uh, or just a rasp. I guess you could use this on metal as well, although I've typically used these on... You know what? Actually, I take that back. This is not a wood rasp. Uh, let me grab a wood rasp. There we go. That's actually a wood rasp. Um, I was calling that the wrong thing. This you would not use on a 3D print. I think it's just too aggressive. The teeth on here are huge. I'm not even sure. Well, let's try it. Yeah, they're just gliding across. It's, uh, that's not really working. Not doing what I want. Uh, I guess it does kind of work, but the teeth are just too far apart. This works really well on soft woods. Um, not so well on 3D printed parts. So... This is, I don't even, I think you'd call this a rasp. I'm not certain now. Maybe it's just a really, uh, like a really coarse file. Um, but here, I'll show you in comparison to a regular file. You can see how much more coarse this is. I'm, I would call this guy a rasp. But anyway, if we take this and we take the rasp. That'll take a nice bite out of that. And we can bring that surface down. And then I can get it closer with just a standard file. Yeah, I'm not really working it too evenly, but I've taken off probably half a mil uh, over here. You get the idea. Um, if you have a smaller surface, like maybe, uh, I don't know, this corner is close to fitting, but it's not quite fitting. And you want to round that over. Let's say maybe this fits down into something else. That'll help you get a good bit of material off uh, to get the clearance you need in comparison to sanding it. But I hear you. Rich, what if I had a power sander? What a delightful smell. PLA kind of smells like uh, french fries almost uh, when you heat it up. And that, that's what's going on here. Um, rather than sand this, uh, the friction just built up heat. And it just started to melt it apart. This warped a bit. Um, and this is not, this down here is just a pile of melted plastic uh, that we can break off. Uh, most people have probably tried this at some point, you know, when they wanted to either smooth out a print before they sanded it. Uh, or reshape part of it is, you know, power sanding on a belt sander like this, or even with a handheld sander. It just doesn't work. It just melts. All right, what's next? Um, the lighter. You guys know this trick? So I'm trying to think. There might be a good example here in my pile somewhere. Let's see what, Oh, actually, this is perfect. So hopefully this shows up on camera. Can you guys see? This is in black PLA, but the, the material has turned white where I used the deburring tool on it. So why is that? Well, you know, uh, plastics are made up of just polymer chains. And when you stress the plastic, and that's what we've done here when we tried to, when I, when I tried to deburr this, I stressed the plastic and that messes with the, the chain of polymers in the, uh, in the plastic. It makes that section weak. Um, and it turns it white like that. It's really apparent on dark color plastics like this. Uh, and, you know, I, I've done this on, you know, even before I got into 3D printing, um, if I had some piece of plastic that I had stressed like that, um, I found that what you can do is just run a lighter uh, over it carefully. And I don't know, if, hopefully that's showing up on, on camera. It's actually, it's recrystallizing uh, the plastic and I'm bringing those polymer chains back together, and now that part is cleaned up. Well, sort of. So we did a little bit of damage to that from uh, the flame in this lighter. It's just, it's too hot. And this is black plastic. If we try that same trick with uh, a lighter color plastic, watch, that's going to make a liar out of me right now. Uh, but often, I've had this happen, and if you guys have tried this before, um, you've probably had it happen to you too. Oftentimes what'll happen is you'll discolor the plastic. It's not gonna do it now. Uh, you can see the damage we caused to that with the, that flame. But oftentimes the carbon in the, uh, in the flame will blacken the material. So you might fix one part of it and you cause another problem by getting a bunch of carbon um, on the print that is you know, black and hard to get off. It tends to just, even if you wipe it off, it tends to get in the layer lines a bit um, and just you know, 
kind of ruins the appearance of the part in a different way. There is a better way, and it is not this guy. What the heck is this? This is kind of an unlikely tool. I didn't buy this for this purpose. I stumbled upon this accidentally. This is a hot air rework station. It's actually for doing electronics work. Let me get this plugged in. All right, so if I flip this guy on, uh, nothing's gonna happen at first because it is sort of in a paused state when this is on the cradle. But this is like, it's kind of like a, a hot air gun uh, on steroids because it has very tight temperature control. Um, a much smaller nozzle that the air comes out of than your typical heat gun, like one of these guys. And I'll show you why you wouldn't want to use one of these guys uh, as well. Um, here's the, you know, just for size comparison, because uh, a lot of people do own these. This is for like stripping paint. Uh, but this guy's much smaller and has really, really tight temperature control because it's for electronics usage. It's for heating up parts. Uh, including the solder and then being able to lift those parts off of a circuit board. But it does so much more. Um, in fact, I use this more for 3D printing than I do for anything else. So I really went to town on this and tried to make a mess out of it. You can see all of the stress marks there on the, uh, on the plastic. Um, really, really chattered that guy up there. Again, just to prove a point here. And I even took a chunk out of the end over here. We'll get to that. So, but let's try cleaning this up here. We'll start with, we'll start with a section that's not too bad, this section here. And I really hope the camera's gonna pick this up. Look at that, it's like I'm airbrushing black paint on there. It cleans it up so nicely. And it's doing it without any damage to the plastic. I don't know if the camera is gonna pick up that surface there, but you can see we have no warping, um, no color change in the plastic or no, no change in the, the, uh, like the refractive index of the plastic. Uh, same thing on our layer over here. Um, a lighter, just, it's just too hot. It just overheats the part. It's not, uh, you, you're not, you can't blow the heat at the part like you can with a, a gun like this. Um, so you're just kind of, you know, trying to heat up that whole area rather than just that, that edge here. All right, let me show you why we don't want to use a heat gun to do this. So in just the amount of time it takes me to, uh, to get that edge hot enough, um, uh, to clean up the stress, you can see we've overheated the, uh, the whole part, uh, this entire thing. We can now see the infill through the part, um, and we've actually warped it as well. The whole thing's no longer straight, so that's well, it was already garbage. All right, my guess is there's probably plenty of brands of these that are just fine. Um, I can only personally speak to this one, no affiliation, but this particular one, I will link this down below. I can attest that it does work well, particularly for the 70 bucks that it costs. All right, last item. This is really kind of a kid's toy. This is one of those 3D pens. And uh, I know a lot of other folks have, uh, have covered this. Um, I find that this does not work as well as a lot of other people would lead you to believe. And I don't know, maybe they have nicer 3D pens. Uh, but I have used this in a pinch to clean stuff up. Let me get this plugged in. All right, there we go, 200 degrees. We are ready to start trying to, uh, to use this. So I am no expert with one of these, but let's see if we can get this filled up. Try and keep it in frame and focused. That is way too fast. All right, I had the feed wrong on that one. I tried to fix this one. Let's, uh, let's take another piece and cause ourselves some, some damage here uh, to try and fix. Okay, can you guys see what I did there? See, so we're all the way through to the, uh, the infill here, so we're, we're to the hollow part of the, the print. Um, so this is not only a cosmetic issue, but it's also a structural issue, as we don't want this guy to, to separate. So let's see if we can fix this. So I'm trying to push the material in first, and then I'm coming back out here and sort of making a blob on there because we're gonna trim this back, but I wanna make sure we have enough material to work with. So let's let this cool. 
All right, I probably put way more material on here than we need. I'm gonna start with the side cutters and see if we can trim uh, some of this excess back. Yeah, that's actually working pretty well. Oh, see, and there's the problem. So even though I was feeding fairly fast with this guy and getting heat into it, uh, it still came off. Uh, I, I'm not sold on using these to repair parts. I think it works fine for cosmetic repairs on parts. Like if you have, you know, a three day long print uh, that just had issues in a couple spots, maybe where you pulled the supports off and it's something, you know, I don't know, figurine or whatever. We just, we don't do stuff like that on this channel. Um, I think it's a viable solution, but for parts that you need strength in, it just, I, I've not had good luck with it. I mean, I really thought that guy was bonded in there pretty well. I even tried to feed it into there and you saw it came off. Yeah, I could have been more gentle with it. I'm using side cutters. I probably could have, um, you know, sat here for half an hour and sanded that guy back down smooth. But if it comes off with a pair of side cutters, uh, it's not going to have any structural uh, integrity in this part. It's not going to add anything to the part. It's just making it pretty. All right, guys. Tell me down in the comments, what's the stuff you're using? What are the tools that you've discovered in you know, your 3D printing workflow over the course of the time that you've been in the hobby that work for you? What, what's the cool stuff that you're doing that maybe I don't know about, that maybe other folks that are watching this video don't know about? Um, get down there in the comments. Uh, read what other people are saying and please tell me what tools and just, you know, other cool things that you're doing to post-process your prints um, that might not be common knowledge. Guys, thanks for hanging out with me in the garage this week. I normally do functional prints on this channel. I uh, did something a bit different this week, uh, but if you're into that sort of thing, uh, consider hitting the subscribe button. I do a new video on a functional print uh, every single Friday. And if you enjoyed this video, hit that like button. It really helps out the channel. And guys, if you do choose to subscribe, I'll see you next Friday.